Hello, this is uh, Professor Gavor again, and we're going to cover chapter two, which is the second chapter we're going to cover in this week one. <clears throat> and we're going to cover the firm and its goals. We want to understand the rationale of why firms exist and explain the economic goals and sometimes the optimal decision making or lack thereof and describe the principal agent problem. We want to distinguish between profit maximization and shareholder wealth maximization and apply uh, market value added and economic value added calculations. So here's the topics. The firm, economic goal of the firm, goals other than profit. Uh, do companies actually maximize profit, maximizing the wealth of shareholders? and uh, this concept of economic profit. So a firm is a collection of various resources um, that a collection of people transforms into products and services demanded by consumers, of which consumers are then willing to pay for those products and services. Profit is the difference between the revenue received, the the sales, the what people pay for those products and services, and what it costs to provide them. Obviously, if the profit is uh, positive, uh, that's the desire of most firms. There are transaction costs incurred when entering into a contract, and this book makes a pretty big um, emphasis on transaction costs. And it's having to do with contracts. It's so they're for outside services. And the type of transaction costs are basically purchasing, negotiation, and then enforcing the contracts. So when we talk about investigation, it's doing the due diligence, the legwork, to find out who are the potential people that can provide those goods and services, and then uh, sorting through that to a small number of them, and then having them bid against each other, which is usually the case, to see who gets the contract. Um, I used to be involved with a lot of these with regard to freight and other logistics services, and uh, and the freight was not limited to land freight, but it was ocean freight, air freight, all different kinds of other aspects. So the negotiation process is part of the um, proposal, bid for proposal, and evaluation of those. And then you award the contract to someone. And just because you award the contract to someone doesn't mean they don't try to, uh, they're going to adhere to all the terms easily. That's why you then have to enforce the contract. Um, if we look in the book, uh, it was, and I'm quoting from page 27, it really started with Adam Smith, who stated that, quote, unquote, or quote, uh, division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, unquote. Uh, George Stigler discussed this in a 1951 article and concluded that as industries expand, companies that previously had produced everything internally will tend to experience what they call vertical disintegration. If you think of this, it's the auto market, which uh, I think I used a lot in the example uh, for chapter one in which at the beginning, Ford Motor Company used to produce almost everything except the rubber parts on the car. And they got those from Firestone, who was a good friend of Henry Ford's. But they made their own engine, they made their own sheet metal, they actually made their own steel from iron ore, and they made their own engines, they made their own spark plugs, they made their own glass, they made their own brakes, every part of the car they made. If you look at what Ford actually makes now, they still make some steel, but not all their steel, and many body components are plastic, and they make their own engines, but almost everything else on an automobile is bought from a supplier, some of which are spin-offs from Ford's original um, divisions that did it. So Ford Glass was bought out by another glass company, uh, the part of Ford that used to make seating was split off and uh, bought up by another seating company, etc. That's called vertical disintegration. 
Um, transaction costs are incurred when entering into a contract, uh, and they're influenced by uncertainty, frequency of recurrence, and asset specificity. Um, I don't know how important this will be moving forward, but, you know, an uh, example I'll give you of kind of the kind of transaction costs you have. Um, I remember when we had a contract with a shipping company uh, out of Brazil. And let's say uh, the container uh, for ocean freight was $2,000. We had a plant there that made a billion tubes of toothpaste a year. And we shipped that, that toothpaste all over the world. So it's coming out of the Port of Santos, uh, close to Sao Paulo. And uh, let's say we're, we had a contract for $2,000, a shipping container, uh, just a rough average. And, and that's for a full-size shipping container. The supply and demand shifted. And even though we had a contract with a shipping company, they weren't giving us any space on their ships. And my boss was quite upset because, uh, hey, we have a contract. Well, we have a contract for $2,000. They don't have any space for a $2,000 contract because they're getting uh, $2,400 and they're giving all their space to that. So we were getting no containers and no space. Um, he says, but we have a contract. I said, well, we're experiencing the flip side of what we would do to the shipping company. If uh, we found out that we had a contract for $2,000 to ship, but we could get it for $1,800 a container, we would surely not ship with that company at all and, and switch to the other company. So they were doing the same thing to us. And I think that what you talk about is uh, the uncertainty involved in some of that. Um, making sure that your assets are possible properly specified so that you get what you ask for. That's why you have incoming inspection and do all those kinds of things. Um, frequency of occurrence would be, um, well, how many times do they send you shipments with no issues? How many times do they send you shipments with issues? So man managing a contract can be quite daunting. And, um, you know, the f if we talk about it, and here we are, again, Kodak. Uh, and this is the, the, the risk of using a book like this. Kodak uses offshoring to source cameras. Well, they did such a horrible job of sourcing cameras, whether they made them themselves or had people in Japan or China make them, that they're actually out of business. IBM sold their computer business to a Chinese company. Exalt, I'm not sure what they do, but they are third-party services used in human resources. There's probably a lot of services like that now. Um, I'm not familiar with that company particularly. Let's look at a counter example to everything that we just talked about. Amazon. Amazon vertically integrates. Uh, the first thing people vertically disintegrate is shipping. They're trucking companies. Uh, if you look at any consumer goods company, you look at an automotive company, they don't want to own any trucks if they don't have to and do the shipping themselves. They would rather hire a third party that's going to handle all the shipping for them, do all the vehicle maintenance, hire the drivers, manage the drivers, um, maintain the equipment, as I said, and that's what they want to do. Um, Amazon is vertically integrating. They're going into their own shipping business. They had the U.S. Postal Service, they had UPS, and they had FedEx working for them, and they think they could do it better, faster, cheaper themselves, and are now vertically integrating. So Amazon is bucking that trend uh, by reducing their contract transaction costs. And if you think of them, you have, um, you know, the firm, a limits to a firm size, is the trade-off between external transactions and the cost of internal operations. So you could either have, if you look at this slide here, if you look at your external operations, you could have 100% outsourced, which is kind of what Apple does. I don't think they make anything themselves. And yet they have one of the best supply chains in the world. Or, and, or, and they have no really internal operations to produce their goods. 
But then you go on, on the other hand and have something like I talked about Ford um, when they were at their founding. They used to make everything themselves and almost had zero. They're probably operating here because they had to buy their tires and rubber hoses, no doubt, from Firestone. So you want to find out for any business, where is that sweet spot of your internal operations costs and your external transaction costs and find out where you go. Now, Amazon is uh, vertically integrating in such a way. They don't make anything, really. They outsource all the products that they have. They just are, are resellers. They're like a, a department store on steroids. They're the Sears catalog of today, if you will. But they're looking to integrate more and more operations internally, including freight, which is kind of weird because no one else is doing that. But the way they're doing it is almost like an Uberization of it. They have a lot of independent people that are exclusively uh, work for Amazon. I mean, you could buy a $30,000, a $32,000 a Mercedes uh, a van and uh, take a little course at Amazon next thing you know you're an Amazon delivery person and this is the way they're trying to get into the grocery business because uh, looking at same-day delivery so anyway the trade-off between external transactions and the cost of internal operations companies choose to allocate resources so that their cost is a minimum and outsourcing peripheral or non-core activities. That was the trend for the longest time, but that has, has changed a lot. Uh, there is another guy, and Ronald Coase, who was a, a Nobel Prize winner. And he, he wrote, it was before the internet, but his ideas are kind of relevant today and this idea of trading off between internal costs and external transactions uh, uh, and search costs is what I think kind of fuels the internet today. You're trying to eliminate middlemen even more so. And like Amazon, their, their key to success has been eliminating the traditional warehouse and the traditional store and creating a new kind of warehouse from which they ship directly to consumers. So they're, they're reducing their internal costs and reducing their external transaction costs at the same time and really trying to uh, make a breakthrough that other people are finding very hard to copy. So what's the goal of a firm? Well, of course, it's profit maximization. And they're talking about a hypothesis here. So the objective, the objective of any company is to make money. And um, other goals include, you know, you might have secondary goals in which you drive your profit, profit maximization. Like one thing is that uh, people look at market share. I remember when I was in consumer goods, uh, Procter & Gamble uh, lived by market share. Of course, profit too. Uh, some look at revenue growth. Some look at shareholder value. And uh, one thing that Colgate, a, a competitor of uh, Procter & Gamble did, was to drive margin. They wanted to drive their margin. They wanted to only sell products that had margins over 50%. And there's a lot of discounting done to move goods, especially at the end of the quarter and the end of the year. So that kind of goal led to their profit maximization. So, but it's a hypothesis, as we said. The optimal decision is one that brings the firm closest to its goal. So how do you take those optimal decisions to drive it? I mean, it's easy to uh, do a linear programming problem in which the goal is profit maximization and you find the right mix of products to make, but that's a, a very one-off kind of thing. A, a modern corporation is much more complicated and you never really know if they've maximized their profits uh, you can show that over time they have increased their profits, but you don't know at any given time if you're actually maximizing the profit because you don't know what the maximum profit could or should be. The other thing is we look at the short run versus the long run. One of the things in the United States that drives business 
is uh, quarterly and yearly uh, yearly profits and yearly performance. Um, in fact, the counting, when they look at a uh, short run, they talk about a year. When they talk about long run, it's more than a year. So uh, in economics, it, it's something else. It has nothing to do with calendar time. Um, short run, the firm can vary the amount of some resources, but not the others. The, 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 amount, the resources that can be varied, remember it was land uh, and labor and capital. You can um, increase labor, but not capital. And I think land would go along with uh, an asset that is um, kind of capital asset. In the long run, if you've changed your capital assets, in other words, if you've increased the size of your factories or the footprint of, it, of a factory or built two factories or taken three factories, as some in the automotive industry have done, and closed, closed them to now have 10 factories instead of 13, um, that, that defines the long term. In the short term, you assume that your capital assets are essentially unchanged. I mean, they're always going to vary because you're always replacing some machinery, you're always maintaining this, and something wears out, you have to get a new one. But uh, for the most part, it's essentially equal, but we're not talking about a quantum change up or down in capital assets. Um, at times, short-run profitability will be sacrificed for long-run purposes. It's not often done in the U.S., um, especially in um, companies with uh, a, a strong set of shareholders. Uh, Jeff Bezos, at, uh, again, is an exception at Amazon, for the longest time kept pouring the profits back into the business, back into R&D, back into improving the way they run their those facilities that I talked about, the combination of the old warehouse and the store to create a new kind of warehouse with a new kind of technology that provided a competitive advantage that's really been hard for others to match up with. And he has a juggernaut of a business, as we all know right now. Um, but for the most part, I think people uh, in this country tend to or companies, U.S. based companies, tend to favor the short-term profitability over the long-term growth. So the economic goals, other than profit, market share, growth rate, profit margin, uh, return on investment, return on assets, technical advancement, uh, customer satisfaction, shareholder value. There's a whole school of thought that just looks at quality, even though we'll see that that's not a, a really a economic measure, even though it probably should be. So, as I said earlier, everybody wants to maximize profit. How do you do it? The management of a company tends to focus on one of these things. A lot of company looks at ROIs and R ROAs. Uh, like I said, Colgate was looking at profit margin. Procter & Gamble was looking at market share. Um, other companies like uh, Apple rely on technology, technological advancement. Um, customer satisfaction is, of course, important. Other companies worry about shareholder value. Uh, at Colgate, it was a combination of profit margin and shareholder value that drove the decisions of the company. Uh, Non-economic objectives uh, have a good and safe working environment, quality products and services. But, you know, quality products and services, uh, there's two types of quality. There's quality in terms of features and being the first on the block to have the new technology. But there's also the quality of human safety and um, health and safety. Well, if you have a product that has to have a recall, that's a net, really huge negative economic impact. And then corporate citizenship and social responsibility. The current generation entering the workforce, uh, all things considered, is looking would rather work for companies that have a strong social responsibility uh, component than not. Now, of course, I kind of think that in this era when there's there has been up until just recently low unemployment, 
you can pick and choose what companies you work for, and social responsibility becomes a component. As people are out of work, and this generation that will be graduating this, this, this year that will be graduating, is going to be hard pressed to find jobs right away. And as the economy spins into a recession due to this uh, coronavirus thing, it's going to be slow to recover. Uh, jobs are going to be more scarce than people looking for jobs. All of a sudden, I don't think people will take any job given and not care about social responsibility as much. That remains to be seen. So do companies actually maximize profit? There's a criticism, but they don't, uh, and I guess this word satisfies, satisfies, is not a word people bandy around often. And it means to achieve a satisfactory goal, one that may not require a firm to do its best. Another way of looking at it, if you don't actually optimize something mathematically, which is the way I tend to think of things, you can maximize, uh, you use a heuristic method, which is a not, it doesn't guarantee an optimal solution, but it guarantees a somewhat in the optimal direction kind of solution. And I think that's how most businesses operate. Uh, there's two forces that affect this satisfaction. Satisfying or satisfy, yeah, I, I can't even pronounce it. Sorry. Uh, position and power of the stakeholders, stockholders, and position and power of the management. Now, why is there a difference between management and, and stockholders? Um, if we think of stockholders, uh, larger public firms are owned by thousands of shareholders. Each shareholder, if you have a share of a company stock, it's like a unit of ownership. Most companies have millions of shares, and they're in the hands, uh, you know, of a, you know, there's some power in the hands of a few, and the rest is spread out over a wide variety of people. If you look at my portfolio, which is not overly impressive, especially these days, you'll find that I probably own about 30, 40, 50 stocks at any given time, and my financial advisor picks and chooses ones that, with some of my blessing that he thinks they're going to be winners, uh, and and the most part, we do okay. When the market's going up, everybody does okay. When the market's doing what it's doing now, it's, uh, it, it's tough to fathom. So shareholders own only small interests in the firm, very small, and hold diversified holdings in many other firms. Now, there are large pension groups. There are... Um, private equity funds, there's um, investment funds that hold larger positions in a company. And oftentimes now because of, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So shareholders are concerned with the performance of their entire portfolio and not individual stocks. I don't know if I buy that. They're interested in the performance of all their stocks. They don't want to hold one um, if it's a dog. Uh, for a long time, and they want to hold one that they think has potential. So they're going to sell stocks that are not moving or not performing the way they want. And um, usually those stocks will sell at prices lower than they bought them for and buy stocks that they think will appreciate so that they can turn around and sell those shares for profit. Um, of course, any shareholder is less informed about how the company operates than the management of the company itself. Um, the stockholders are not likely to take any action if they're earning a satisfactory return. And the return is on the price of the stock, but also the dividend that the stock pays. The position of power management is generally in the same direction, but it's not necessarily aligned. High-level managers may own very little of the firm stock, and uh, managers tend to be a little bit more conservative uh, only because they want to make their jobs safe. Uh, and to do that, they like to keep their performance steady and maybe not spectacular, even though you have some 
some, you know, the better known CEOs are the ones that deliver more spectacular results. Now, the fact that high level managers may own very little stock, um, the way companies in the past, I would say since the 70s, um, incent their management to operate in a way that benefits the shareholders is to make the compensation of the top management consistent or, or dependent on the performance of the stock. So if the stock goes up, they have a chance to make a lot more money. So they give, um, they give stock options. So let's say I'm working for a company and I'm an executive and I get a bonus this year. That's fine. I get a salary. I get a bonus. I'm pretty happy. I'm making a lot of money. But they maybe they give me um, 10,000 shares of stock, an option to buy 10,000 shares of stock at $100, which is the current market rate. Now, as a senior manager, if we can make the stock go up to 150, I've just made $50,000. Because I have 10,000 shares, it's going up to $50. Actually, I've made more than that. I can't do math. I probably should do this arithmetic beforehand. Let me uh, calculate that. You probably already calculated it because you're all smarter than me. Um, 10,000 times 50, it's going to be half a million dollars. It's going to be $500,000. So I can make the stock go up in five years to that, and I don't ever have to buy the stock. It doesn't cost me anything. I just turn around and in an instant buy 10,000 shares of stock for $100, which is uh, it cost me $100,000, but I turn around and immediately sell it for uh, 150, and now my stock is worth $500,000. And um, so I've aligned the management and the shareholder perspectives. The other thing is um, a, a large percentage of executive compensation now is based on the stock plan. So you get stock grants, but they outright just give you stock at bonus time or and have a um, most people's retirement plan are based on um, okay every dollar you put in to buy a share of stock the company will contribute a dollar or maybe 60 cents and so it's like a, a six percent raise if you want automatically and no one turns that down so you accumulate all this this am amount of stock in the company. So now you're doing two things. You're um, a manager of the company and you're also really seriously paying attention to the stock. And much of this is public. The vice president of uh, Colgate, when I was uh, working in the Latin America division, the vice president of um, Latin America or president of Latin America operations, I think for five years in a row cashed in his options for five million dollars um, and five years in a row he did that. So that significant chunk of compensation. It grossly exceeded his salary. So do companies maximize profit or do they maximize shareholder value? Are they the same thing? That's the big question. Because the things you do to maximize shareholder value, maybe it tends to be short-term optimization, short-term profit, but maybe at the expense of the long-term health of the company. You could argue that uh, Jack Welch, who recently passed away in, in the past few months, was the darling CEO of General Electric for many years, and he created a ton of shareholder value for himself and the major shareholders of General Electric. I was a shareholder of General Electric, but definitely not major. Uh, upon his leaving the company, the people that took over did not have his skill for balancing that short-term growth and uh, long-term growth, however he managed to do it. 
and have basically his his handpicked successor basically sunk the company. It's it, it dropped out of the Dow Jones average, which is kind of crazy. So the position and power of management. Managers may be, or certainly may be more interested in maximizing their own income and perks, and management incentives may be misaligned uh, and looking at revenues, not profit. Because sales are a huge thing. Um, diversion of the objectives between the owners and the management, the shareholders and the management, is called the principal agent problem. If we look at that, if you don't understand what it is, and I've given a homework problem on it, um, if I don't understand, I look at Investopedia, as I mentioned before. So the principal agent problem is the conflict in priorities between one person or group and the rep representative authorized to act on their behalf. So in this case, the shareholders are the owners of the company and the management is authorized to act on their behalf. An agent may act in a way that is contrary to the best interests of the principal. So the principal agent is as varied as possible. Like another principal agent, uh, I have a financial advisor. Um, you know, I'm interested in increasing the size of my portfolio. He only gets paid, uh, and this is less the case now than it used to be, only gets paid if every time there's a transaction, in other words, if he sells some stock or buys a stock, every time that happens, he takes a percentage. So if all my stocks are doing really well and continuing to appreciate, and I could be very happy. He has an incentive to sell stock and buy new ones because every time he does that, that's how he makes his money. So there you have a, an example of the principal agent problem. So it's a conflict in priority sometimes, uh, and it can occur in many relationships, a client and a lawyer, um, because the lawyer, you know, is, is going to get a commission is going to get paid no matter if you go to jail or not or if you have to pay or if the size but oftentimes we're, we're lawyers and principals are aligned if you're suing someone and if they get 30% of what the take is and nothing if there is no no take so they're going to want to settle uh, they would definitely like to have a higher settlement than you, but also they look at how much time it will take to get that higher settlement and is it worth it for them. It's certainly worth it for you. I could wait another year to maybe get another million dollars in a $2 million settlement, but the lawyer may say uh, another year of my time is not worth it. I'll take the $2 million settlement and take 30% of that right now and uh, move on to the next one. So resolving this problem requires changing the system of rewards in order to make sure the priorities of both. That's why I think when they move to stock options and stock grants and your, your, your compensation heavily dependent on the stock price, they aligned shareholder value with, um, with, with that of the management. Now, is that the best thing for the long-term health of the company? That is completely and totally debatable. So, uh, counter arguments which support the profit maximization hypothesis. Large st stock holdings held by institutions, mutual funds, banks, and uh, they, there's a lot of scrutiny by prof professional analysts. Uh, stock market discipline implies if managers do not seek to maximize profits, firms, firms face threat or takeover. Uh, incentive effect, the compensation of many executives is tied to the uh, stock prices we've talked about. So it's, I don't know if stock price and performance are, are the same thing. Uh, maximizing the wealth of stockholders. So from uh, the firm, you know, views of the firm from the perspective of the stream of profits or cash flows over time. The value uh, depends on when cash flow occurs. Requires the concept of time value of money. In other words, a dollar earned in the future is worth less than a dollar earned today. And this drives short-term profit, which can be the bane of American, um, uh, American capitalism, in, in a sense. 
if you look at firms in the United States, they're, if they're focusing on short-term profitability and driving short-term profit, and a company like China, a country like China is uh, inducing their firms to have a more long-term view. I mean, of course, they want to make money in the short term, but the long-term growth uh, is more important. Um, I don't know that this short-term firm can compete um, well with a firm that's working in the long term. It's like you're playing checkers and they're playing chess in a certain view. So there's formulas for this. The future cash flows, D sub I, so uh, I being some year into the future, have to be discounted to find their present equivalent value. The discount rate K is affected by risk. There's two kinds of risk, business risk and financial risk. Business risk is a variation due to the ups and downs of the economy, the industry, and the firm. All firms face business risk to a varying degree. Uh, and you have, um, there are going to be shocks as well. You have the random little shocks, uh, a little tornado here, a hurricane there, a drought, uh, those kinds of things that may have a positive or negative impact on, on your business, depending on what kind of event it was and what your your products are. Or you could have a major, a major league uh, ran, uh, shock, like this coronavirus thing that we're in right now. Financial risks are um, concerns by the variation in returns that is induced by leverage. What do we mean by leverage? It's a proportion of a company financed by debt. If your debt level is too high, the higher the leverage, the greater the potential fluctuations in stockholder earnings. Uh, financial risk is directly related to the degree of leverage. Um, when a private equity firm buys a company, they usually load up the company with debt and reap the cash out of the company and then maybe even spin it off or sell it to someone else. Now the incentive of the management to run a company that's highly leveraged, and they call them leveraged buyouts for a reason, have to deal with this mountain of debt. A company that was operating very well with a large cash position and was making money all of a sudden becomes a plum uh, objective for private equity firms to buy it and load it up with debt and reap cash out of it and then spin it off or sell it off. And then the company has to then struggle its way to pay off that debt. So maximizing the wealth of shareholders. Here's the formula that you use for that. P is the present price of the stock. D is the dividends received per year, year one, year two, year three, all the way to year N, however many years into the future you're looking, and you have a discount rate um, that you're discounting the future years. So if their discount rate is uh, 1% or 2%, you would be adding 1.01 .01 or 1.02, and then what you do is in the previous years, you're you're paying maybe the same dividend, but you're squaring the discount rate, you're cubing the discount rate by the same index of the um, of the dividend. So this is your dividend in year three, so you're cubing that rate, so you're discounting it. You're saying basically the rate is going to be, uh, I'm discounting it by 2% over three years, so it's uh, 102 times 102 times 102, so it becomes what? Uh, you do the math. I'm, I don't have a calculator with me. Again, I should have probably done that before. So if the firm is assumed to have an infinitely long life, the price of a unit of stock which earns a dividend, D, per year is given by just the equation, the dividend divided by the, the discount rate. Given an infinitely lived firm, and I think you could assume Apple is infinitely lived in a sense, even though no firm is infinitely lived. Dividends grow at a constant rate, G, each year, and the equation for the stock price becomes 
uh, the dividend paid during the coming year and divided by the discount rate minus the growth. Uh, multiplying P times the number of shares uh, gives you the total value of the firm's common stock or the market capitalization is what people talk about. So if you didn't know what market capitalization is, you kind of do know. And if you don't understand it, given my cursory explanation, you've got the textbook to read, you've got this, these slides to study. So companies try to manage their businesses in ways that the dividends over time pay for its earnings and risk incurred uh, to bring about a stream of dividends that always creates the highest price for the stock company's stock. Not all companies pay dividends, and uh, the blue chip ones are the ones that pay good dividends, and people buy the stock for the dividend as much as they do for the appreciation of the stock price. Um, when stock options are substantial parts of the management's compensation, uh, the objectives tend to be more aligned with the shareholder objective, as we talked about. So uh, you'll look at some of these companies where you know, not reducing, I mean, General Electric paid great dividends. Cutting those dividends to almost zero, and I think they might even be zero now, was a, a horrible shock to the people that were shareholders in that company. But management, uh, there was that principal agent problem. The shareholders assumed everything was going well, but uh, maybe not so well, and management was not acting on behalf of the shareholders as Jack Welch was. Another measure of, of the wealth of stockholders or shareholders is called market value added. It's the difference between the market value of the company and the capital that investors have paid into the company. And you have the market value includes both equity and debt. Uh, capital includes the book value of equity and debt, as well as certain adjustments, accumulated R&D and goodwill, which are part of the measure. I'm not sure how we measure goodwill. Um, while the company value of the, I mean, the market value of the company is always positive, MB, MVA could be positive or negative. So another measure of wealth is called economic value added. And it's a return on total capital minus the cost of capital times total capital. If the EVA is greater than zero, shareholder growth is rising. If it's less than zero, it's falling. So uh, the return, you know, basically, it's positive or negative because if your return on total capital is bigger than the cost of capital, that becomes a positive number. If your return on total capital is less than the cost of capital, it becomes negative. If the return on your total capital is less than the cost of the capital, you're better off taking whatever capital you had and lending it out to others because they're obviously better at getting a return on it than you are. I mean, just the simple act of lending it, is, it gives you a better return than you are generating yourself in your company. So let's talk about economic profit. Um, economic profits and accounting profits are typically different. And accountants uh, follow you know, the gap, generally accepted, generally accepted accounting principles, and measure explicit incurred costs. Accountants use the historical cost of machines. And economists are concerned with implicit costs called opportunity costs. So economists use replacement costs of machines. For example, economic costs include historical and explicit accounting costs, as well as the replacement and implicit costs. Economic profit is total revenue minus all economic costs. Like another way of looking at it, um, I have a job. Uh, let's say it pays $100,000 a year. I quit this job to uh, start my own business. Now, my business may or may not be profitable. Let's say I have a business and 
uh, the sales of the business are 100, 200,000. So the sales are more than my wages were working for someone else. And, but my costs, and let's only look at the explicit costs of the business, were 150. So the business showed a profit of $50,000. Now, I am the uh, sole person working in that company. Maybe it's a consulting company. Or maybe it's a manufacturing company, but I'm the sole owner. So my wages, my salary, everything is the profit of that company. So my implicit costs were... $150,000. My accounting profit was $50,000. Was this a good business decision for me to leave a $100,000 a year job for a $50,000 a year job? Even though accounting wise, the business showed a profit. I should be happy. But accounting profit would say, no, there's an implicit cost. Uh, I forsake, I forsook a $100,000 job. So my account, economic costs were the implicit costs plus the explicit costs plus the implicit costs. The explicit costs were $150,000. The implicit costs were $100,000. So I had $250,000 of cost. And I made $250,000, so I've lost $50,000, which is the difference between what I would have made if I stayed where I was, and what I'm making in my new business. Now, uh, can I live on that? Am I happy with it? You know, there's other factors to be uh, talked about. But clearly it was not a good economic decision if that happens. If the next year I can sell $300,000 worth and have the same cost of one hundred fifty, well, then I'm a happier person then. But that's kind of one way of looking at economic profits. Um, if you look at the global application of this, uh, if you're operating around the world, you have different currencies, you have differences in the legal systems, you have differences in the language. Uh, you know, it's pretty hard to operate without having people that speak the local language, even though the the lingua franca of business is pretty much English at this point. The attitudes of the people are different. The role of government is different. Um, you know, if, if most of U.S.-based companies uh, do not want to have anything to do with bribery to get things done, bribing government officials or um, whatever. But in other countries, that's not only the norm, it's almost expected. How do you account for that? So we have this global foods case again, which I think you should look at and say, maybe we'll try to have a discussion on that. Um, I haven't formalized the discussions yet. I'm doing the lectures first to get that out. And then the questions on page 43 and 44 are 6, 7, uh, 14, and 15. So if we go to that page, those pages, Six and seven are like more discussion question. Discuss the meaning of the term principal agent problem. What, why does this problem exist? Uh, seven is why may corporate managers not specifically aim at profit or wealth maximization for their companies? And then 14 and 15 are, do you believe the profit maximization model can be applied to the activities of a multinational corporation? Well, Yes and no, of course they can. What are transaction costs? How does the opportunistic behavior tend to increase transaction costs? So um, basically chapter one and two is mostly essay kinds of questions. You can probably do all your answers in Microsoft Word. And we'll take a look at that. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we get into supply and demand and get into a little bit of math with chapter three. Thank you very much.